tonight on CBC Vancouver News. It undermines uh, the reputation and the credibility of, of, of industry. An unlicensed mortgage broker accused of duping banks into hundreds of millions worth of deals also. It's simply a case of my wanting to make sure that we have data secure. Speaker Daryl Plekis accused of copying staffers' computer hard drives at the B.C. Legislature and... We will locate, we will find the suspect. Why the key to a B.C. cold case could lie in one of those popular genealogy tests. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening. A public warning tonight from B.C. financial regulators after an unlicensed mortgage broker allegedly handled more than half a billion dollars worth of mortgages. Now the Registrar of Mortgage Brokers has issued a cease and desist order against him. As the CBC's Tina Lovegreen reports, the shady deals have been going on for a decade. Jay Chaudhry collected almost $6 million worth of fees even though he's not a licensed mortgage broker and hasn't been for more than 10 years. In 2008, he was suspended for four months after allegedly using false information to secure financing for his clients from a range of banks. He's accused of falsifying tax documents, saying his clients worked for companies that didn't exist and earning more income than they actually did. After his suspension in 08, he never renewed his license. But last year, BC's financial services regulators started getting tips that Chaudhry was working again. This time, going through a network of at least 20 licensed mortgage brokers and realtors to get financing for his clients. The whole time, collecting hefty fees. Uh, Mr. Chowdhury uh, has deliberately attempted to avoid detection uh, in his activities by using pseudonyms, multiple phone numbers, different email addresses and, and companies, uh, as well as a network of registered sub-mortgage brokers to... According to the cease and desist order from 2009 to mid-2018, he worked on 875 deals, made more than $5 million in client fees, and arranged over half a billion dollars in mortgage loans. The regulator says these kinds of deals put borrowers at risk of being locked into mortgages they can't afford, which is why people are encouraged to do their homework. I'd also encourage industry to report any and all suspected uh, misconduct. I think this file re represents an instance where maybe on a transaction by transaction uh, basis, um, um, what might seem like a good idea at the time, making a quick buck, um, uh, can, can balloon to this, to this magnitude. And this is just the beginning. There are multiple investigations into the mortgage brokers who played a part in this fraudulent activity. CBC News did reach out to Chaudhry for comment, but hasn't heard back. And he does have a right to appeal the cease and desist order. But if the order is breached, it could result in fines or even jail time. Tina Lovegreen, CBC News, Vancouver. More drama at the B.C. Legislature on the final day of the spring session. The B.C. Liberals are taking extreme measures to try to have Daryl Plekis removed as Speaker of the House. As Provincial Affairs reporter Tanya Fletcher explains, it comes after concerns he's been copying the hard drives of staff computers. That is absolutely ridiculous. A familiar face and voice is again at the center of developing drama out of the B.C. Legislature. And now there are calls to have Daryl Plekis replaced as Speaker of the House. It all started yesterday with a three-hour meeting between him and the House leaders. Liberal Mary Polak produced 16 pages of notes she took detailing what she calls disturbing interactions. It was very erratic. Uh, it was almost like a stream of consciousness kind of speech and very aggressive. In that meeting, she says Plakis repeated his view that the independent investigation into legislature misspending was flawed. Beverly McLaughlin's report found some cases of misconduct by the clerk, but ultimately cleared the sergeant at arms. Polak says Plakis seemed to take it personally, and he suggested he would continue his own investigation. He certainly made it clear numerous times in the meeting that he would go where he needed to go and that he felt he had the authority to access any information in the building from any hard drive or any office. A few hours after that meeting, Liberal leader Andrew Wilkinson says he witnessed this. Last night I was here in the building and witnessed Mr. Plekis and Mr. Mullen and a third person carrying a computer hard drive into his office from an unknown source. 
worried the B.C. Liberals had a senior staffer camp out in their head office overnight to make sure none of their computers were accessed. When asked about it after question period today, Speaker Daryl Plekis defended his actions. It's simply a case of my wanting to make sure that we have data secure online and other computers, and people did not have to do this. But the B.C. Liberals claim the Speaker has gone too far, saying they're gravely concerned about his conduct. So they reached out to the NDP this morning with an offer. In order to make clear this isn't any kind of political stunt to put up a B.C. Liberal as a Speaker until at least next spring. But that idea was shot down by Premier John Horgan later in the day. It's not the responsibility of the opposition to say we want a new one. It's unclear what will happen next, but for now it seems Speaker Daryl Plekis has no intention of going anywhere. I have responsibility for security. I'm making sure that we have proper security with respect to data. Tanya Fletcher, CBC News, Victoria. The Alberta government has dished out more than $1 million to put pro-pipeline billboards in this city, hoping to help British Columbians see the positives in the Trans Mountain expansion. Alberta's Energy Minister announced today more than 30 billboards displaying the Say Yes to TMX message. It highlights BC's high gas prices and pitches the pipeline as a solution, even though some experts have said an approved expansion may not significantly reduce fuel costs. I don't think anyone's going to be swayed towards being in favour of the expansion. We need to be moving away from the oil industry and, and looking to greener technology. So I don't really think that's wisely spent money. The billboards will be up until June 18th when the Trans Mountain decision is expected. Well, it took less than three hours for a lockout at BC's ports to end. The union for 6,500 workers reached a tentative deal with their employer with the help of federal mediators. Details of the agreement will be made public once union members ratify the deal. The BC Maritime Employers Association and the International Longshore and Warehouse Union had been negotiating since yesterday afternoon. Both sides say they're satisfied with the pending agreement. To be quite candid, uh, it's an emotional moment. <laughs> uh, we got a lot of strong people in, in our union and we've done a good job. Uh, and I want to thank them all. Uh, they've, they've done us proud, our people. BC ports do millions of dollars in business every day. A work stoppage threatened to hit Canada's economy hard. The Port of Vancouver says a third of all goods Canada trades beyond North America move through the port. Life expectancy has dropped in BC for the second consecutive year, and the opioid crisis is being blamed. In 2017, life expectancy in BC fell to around 80 for men and 84 and a half for women, according to Stats Canada. Nearly 1,500 people died of illicit drug overdoses in B.C. that year. 2017 was also the first year in four decades when the life expectancy across Canada did not go up. Started off a little cloudy, but turned into a pretty good one today. Meteorologist Colette Kennedy is here now for the first look at the weather. Colette? Thanks, Anita. Well, not really seeing much of a change in our pattern. We still have that ridge of high pressure in place. Yes, some hazy conditions at times because our winds are just so light. So still seeing kind of the smoky skies. And I have to tell you, it probably won't be till the weekend when the winds will pick up a little bit stronger coming in from the west. And that'll start to change things up a little bit. But overnight tonight, we'll call it partly cloudy conditions. The so wind's light. And by tomorrow morning, a mix of sun and cloud, 15 degrees. Look at tomorrow afternoon, though. Yeah, 21 degrees, but inland 26. The Humidex closer to 28 or 29. And also a reminder that even with the hazy conditions, too, that with the UV index, it is going to be 8 or very high. So we still need to protect ourselves and need our sunscreen. Now, as for what the weekend's looking like, Anita, Mike, I'll have that coming up a little later in the show. Thanks very much, Colette. Well, apparently there's a, a basketball game going on tonight. Yes, Toronto. Colette even has her Raptors, yes, Raptors red on. Yes, Raptors red, yes. And... Uh, a lot of people are excited, uh, especially our Dan Burrett. Yes, he is out in Gastown live, <laughs> and he's with a lot of really excited basketball fans. Dan, what are you hearing there? The great thing is here at Charles Bar, we've got everything. Take a look at this. In the corner, we've got NBA Jam. I know Jesse Johnson will be very excited about that, as will I. Oh, and our own Matthew Lowe. And by coincidence, the NBA Finals, they're just introducing the Raptors right now. 
Raptors fans here have been waiting a plenty and getting in just before happy hour and fueling up as they watch the Raptors take on the Golden State Warriors in game one. The first time the Raptors have been in this championship. Probably fair to say this is the first time a lot of people in Metro Vancouver are cheering for a Toronto team that isn't drenched in white and blue. It's red, black, and white. And for the first time, and perhaps not for the first time, but for the first time, in terms of excitement, we see people across the country from pros to colleges to high schools, academies and camps, and we've seen it in Richmond and elsewhere. People are excited about this team. They're excited about basketball, perhaps a bit nostalgic here in, Metro, here in Vancouver. We remember our lovely Grizzlies, wondering if that'll come back. But for now, the Raptors are the focus. They're hoping it'll be a long run and a win in the NBA Finals. Anita, Mike? Raptors fever is everywhere. Dan, thank you very much. Live in Gastown for us tonight. Good time there. All right. Just a reminder, you can watch our newscast wherever you are, even if you want to spend time outdoors. Mm -hmm. We're streaming the show live every day on Facebook, YouTube, and on our free mobile app, CBC Gem. And if you do want to go more in-depth on our stories, you can visit our website, cbc.ca slash bc. Coming up, why the key to an unsolved Vancouver murder could lie in one of those popular genealogy tests. Well, a new program is giving some university students a taste of the Yukon, literally a taste, including a lesson on foraging for edible plants. The CBC's Philippe Morin tagged along for the trip. The students have been learning about northern food, and today they're meeting at Michel Genet's house. So I've got 22 students from the University of Guelph. They're at a field school in the Yukon, and this, I believe, is one of their last events. So we're going to make it a good one. Genet is an author who goes by the name the Boreal Gourmet. Today she's going to guide these students in a walk foraging for edible plants. And soap berries and black currants and red currants. It turns out you don't need to go far. It's a question of once you start looking, you start seeing more and more, and you realize edible wild food is all around us. The big thing right now is uh, spruce tips, and those are the little buds that grow on a, on a spruce tree when it's just putting out its new growth. They, of course, have been used by Indigenous people in the Yukon for thousands of years. Um, and today we're, we're going to really focus on uh, making a spruce tip syrup. The students bring what they foraged to the well-bred Culinary Institute, a cooking school in Whitehorse. They use what they gathered on the walk and also some local berries held over from last season. We made rhubarb syrup and we put cranberries in it. It was bright red. It was beautiful. It tasted really great, but it was a little bit tart. Some of the plants had unexpected uses. Kat McEnroy cooked these dandelions in a mixture of white rice flour and soda water, something she calls dandelion tempura. Well, I was born and raised here, and my dad had a trap line when I was growing up out in Carmack, so eating locally foraged uh, flowers, berries, parts of the trees, that's nothing that's new to me. This is the first year the University of Guelph has offered this course. Students visited Dawson City and Whitehorse learning all about northern food. Philippe Morin, CBC News, Whitehorse. That looks like a lot of fun. Um, you're back. Uh, welcome back. You've been away on assignment for a few days doing some foraging of your own for a story. Yes, uh, we were up a few hours north of Fraser Lake where hundreds of nomadic pickers have been hunting for morel mushrooms. They pop up basically after there's been a wildfire. So we've got a great story coming in sometime in the next week or so. So the wildfires, as devastating as they can be, uh, provide a, a very rich environment for these uh, mushrooms. Yes, and the mushrooms are beautiful and they are delicious. So it's kind of uh, an interesting toss up, right? You have this devastation mm -hmm. and then you have some beautiful morels popping up after. And you bumped into some interesting pictures along the way. We did. Some characters will have uh, some of their stories. One woman who's five months pregnant and still <laughs> hunting for morels. Good so, stuff. We'll yeah. look forward to it. All right, we have more news coming up right in a couple of months. Well, it's the first time in Canada police are using genetic genealogy to try to catch a killer. 
and it's being done right here by Vancouver police. It's a technique that was used to catch the infamous Golden State Killer, but as Greg Rasmussen finds out, there are some serious privacy concerns. This one here is on Tanya's 18th birthday, when posing with my father, and so unfortunately it turned out to be her last birthday. John Van Kylenborg still feels the deep pain of his sister's murder 32 years ago. He recalls those dark days of anxiety and fear after she and her boyfriend Jay Cook failed to return from a brief trip to Washington State. Soon, the family's worst fears were realized. Yeah, yeah, it's something you never forget, of course, and yeah, it's just horrific, but don't wish it on anyone. 18-year-old Tanya Van Kylenberg's body was found along this quiet country road, dumped in this ditch. Despite thousands of hours of police work, more than three decades passed with no arrest. Hope faded. That always ate away at me because it sure didn't feel right that, you know, somebody wouldn't be held accountable, that, you know, this wasn't going to be solved, that some, you know, something so horrific could happen and somebody would not be held accountable. State of Washington versus William Talbot. Then, finally, last year, Earl Talbot, a 59-year-old truck driver, was tracked down and charged with two counts of murder. Police had Talbot's DNA from the crime scene but had never found a match. But recently... A breakthrough. Millions of people are uploading their genetic profiles to Ancestry websites, and some of them are accessible to police. You upload your DNA looking for long-lost family connections. Then police compare your DNA to the sample from a crime scene. They find a few shared genetic markers, which leads them to their suspect. In Talbot's case, a distant relative was found with similar genetic markers. Police then grabbed a coffee cup he had used and tested it. All right, so we've got a swab here. We're going to get it wet. This lab at the BC Institute of Technology shows how a match was made. And now we're going to break this swab head into a new tube and just get the DNA from the person of interest. Forensic scientist Steen Hartson says DNA testing is getting much more precise. You're able to make much further comparisons and create these family trees where you might be able to associate people who only share a great, great, great grandparent, uh, whereas the older technology just wasn't able to do that. You weren't looking at enough areas in the DNA for that type of analysis. Along with ancestry searches, it's helped crack more than 50 serious cold cases south of the border. And there are high hopes for it here. So what goes through your head as you come back to the scene of the crime? For me personally, I go back to, you know, how horrible it must have been for his friends and family and everyone that knew Mr. Leonardo to find him in that state. Vancouver Police Detective Mike Hurd is using it to try to solve a murder that took place 16 years ago in this building. So this is our victim, Edgar Leonardo. Hurd's theory is the 36-year-old man met someone in Vancouver's gay village and brought him home late at night. And at some point he was murdered in here and the suspect, the only thing left behind is a bit of DNA. That's correct. Leonardo's murder remains unsolved even though police have DNA from the suspected killer. But it's never matched any samples in Canadian police files. We actually have good DNA. We just don't have a suspect, which is really unusual in this line of work. So I'm hoping with these uh, new technologies and phenotyping um, and locating uh, through the genealogy that we're actually going to come onto a suspect uh, sooner rather than later. Parabon Nanolabs. He's now using the same U.S. company that helped solve dozens of cases in the United States. It's always about trying to narrow your scope down of potential suspects and then working your way through all the suspects until you find the person that actually committed the crime. This is the first time a Canadian police force has publicly stated it's using the technique. I'm a firm believer on, based on all my experience and looking at the evidence in this investigation, that we will locate, we will find the suspect. An accused person could possibly have a privacy interest. In Vancouver criminal defense lawyer Tony Paisana says it's only a matter of time until this technique becomes the focus of a trial in a Canadian courtroom. At issue, is it legal to sift through DNA profiles looking for family connections? And that creates this sort of interesting issue of whether or not the person on trial has a privacy interest in the DNA profile of someone else, be it a brother or sister or whoever it is that ends up having their sample given to the police. And then this is her and I just relaxing outside on the patio, I think, at family home. 
It's been more than 20 years since the federal government created the laws around the use of DNA testing in Canada. John Van Kylenborg says the breakthrough that led to an arrest in his sister's murder should be widely used. If it requires some legislative amendment or revisions, then so be it. Um, but I, I would be disappointed in Canadian society if we decided not to make use of this investigative tool. A true breakthrough in policing that's helped answer questions for one Canadian family with the potential to help many more. Greg Rasmussen, CBC News, Vancouver. Dozens of shipping containers brimming with Canadian garbage are being sent back to this country. And yeah, that trash has been sitting in the Philippines for nearly six years. Our David Common explains how it got there and what's going to happen next. Canada's garbage, which traveled halfway around the world for disposal, is now on its way back, stuffed inside dozens of shipping containers filled with plastic, ostensibly for recycling, but contaminated with dirty diapers and electronic waste. For years, the Philippines has demanded Canada take it back, turning it into a bombastic diplomatic issue. The Filipino foreign minister there as the waste was loaded, tweeting, going, going, and now it's gone, headed back to Vancouver. Once there, it'll be incinerated right here, a waste to power facility. It's gonna be dealt with uh, after hours so that it doesn't, doesn't interfere with uh, with the waste that we normally put through the facility and uh, and also to ensure that it's inspected properly. All this will cost the Canadian taxpayer more than a million dollars. The feds say all possible options to encourage accountability by the exporter are being pursued. But that company appears to be defunct, so getting money from it may be challenging. And so for now, the feds are on the hook. It's being loaded right now. It had to be fumigated. There's a long process it had to go through. Um, so that it'll be out very shortly. This is, I think, from the Maritime. Scotland. Earlier this week, we were at a port in Malaysia as the country demanded Canada take back another shipping container. It underscores just what happens to some of the contents of our blue bins, sent far away, exporting a problem. But the global recycling industry is opaque, and many unscrupulous operators simply change the label on shipping containers. As 69 of those containers left the Philippines bound for Canada today, environmental activists were there urging Canada and other developed nations to end the practice of exporting their waste, to work on reducing plastic use instead, rather than recycling or dumping it elsewhere. David Common, CBC News, Toronto. A CBC reporter spent a month living as a high school student in Surrey. What Jason D'Souza learned about life as a modern student by going back to class. That's coming up.
And here are some of the stories we're following tonight on CBC Vancouver News. Uh, represents a significant risk to the integrity of the real estate and financial services marketplace. A warning to the public after an unlicensed mortgage broker is accused of duping banks into hundreds of millions worth of deals. He's been handed a cease and desist order. We have ongoing investigations. We do not want an instance where we have data not available to investigators. It's that The BC Liberals are calling for Speaker Daryl Plekis to be replaced. The party now offering up one of its own MLAs to take the job. It all comes after concerns Plekis has been copying the hard drives off staff computers. With the help of mediators, the Union for Longshoremen has reached a tentative deal to end a lockout at BC's ports. Details of the agreement will be made public once union members ratify the deal. Well, to return to one of the most nervous and formative experiences most of us go through, high school. For four weeks, we embedded our reporter in Surrey's L.A. Matheson Secondary to learn about the joys and the struggles of today's students directly from those students. Our Jason D'Souza got the full experience. He went to class, did homework, all in a school environment that is shifting along with technology and broader social change. Mike spoke to him earlier today. And Jason is back with us tonight, uh, unembedded from Matheson. <laughs> what was it like being back in high school? It was this really interesting, I would say, juxtaposition, really, between familiarity yeah. and newness. Because, you know, it's a high school, so things are going to look familiar. You, sure. have your, you have your lockers, you have your classroom, you have your students. But then, you know, as with any high school, there's that unique aspect of it, too. And one of the things that makes Matheson unique is the cultural composition of this school. 70 to 80% of the students here are of South Asian background. And that creates some really, really fascinating cultural dynamics. Have you heard of the term brown washing before? Me, no, I haven't. Yeah, so I hadn't heard of it either, but apparently it's very common at this school. And the right. idea is uh, you get brown washed if you're not one of these students who's of South Asian background. Mm. And that means uh, you pick up some of the cultural aspects, you pick up some of the languages. And it's just, it was one of the most fascinating aspects of this experience. Uh, just take a look at my interaction with one of these students who admits he's been brown washed. Yeah, totally. Like, uh, I know some Punjabi, like, Kidna Sasiga. Well, I've grown up in Surrey, like, all my life, so I've been really, like, accustomed to, like, being around other races. And, like, for me, it's not about race. Like, I'm brown, or I'm white, you're brown. It's more of just, like, I'm a human, you're a human, right? So it's one of those things that makes Matheson so unique. And the other fascinating aspect of this idea of brownwashing, Mike, is the impact it has on those students who are South Asian. Mm. Take a look. Very exciting. I, lo I love seeing it. It makes me happy. It makes me like proud of who I am. Like other people, like coming into our culture and like uh, learning the culture and just celebrating it as a whole, right? And every every year we have like a Vasaki celebration. I just love seeing people from other cultures come join us and just have fun with us, right? I just love that. Isn't it such a snapshot of the multiculturalism we see in our society? Yeah, you captured uh, that for focused sure. Focused yeah. into the high school. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Um, so. Uh, you spent time in the classroom itself. What did you learn outside the classroom? <laughs> so many things. Uh, most of all, how old I'm getting. <laughs> Join the club. <laughs> Half the time, I couldn't even understand what these kids are trying to tell me yeah. because uh, the slang these days, it, it felt honestly like I was in a foreign land sometimes. I was trying to decipher what they were trying to say through the slang. I'm going to throw some slang at you to, okay. to, to see if you, you, know, you maybe could do better. Do you know what spill the tea means? No idea. Yeah, I had no idea either. Apparently, that's kind of talking about gossip. But yeah, I mean, you know, as part of this project, just deciphering the code, deciphering the language, a very, very interesting aspect of high school today. Have a look. This one is hundies. This is your favorite word, because I taught you this. And so what does it mean? So you say like hundies? for sure, like cut for sure, like, all right, yeah. like, let's go. Okay. Like, kind of like that. So, hey, do you want to get lunch? Hundies. <laughs> okay, so use let's get this bread in a sentence for me. Oh, okay, so let's start off a conversation first, be like, I'm going to job, say something like that, or let's let's go to work. So you would say that. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to work. Actually, I'm working right now. So technically. Okay. So you're getting, getting that bread. bread. Yeah, you're getting the bread. Good I like job. It. There you go. <laughs> wow. And technically, obviously, you and I are working right now. So congratulations, Mike. You're getting this bread. <laughs> Thanks, buddy. That was good. You, you, you really actually fit in quite well there. I did my best. You could see me with the little backpack on, you yeah, know, trying to get the, that. Get, get the kids as comfortable as possible. But really, um, I have to say, looking back at this project, I'm just so full of gratitude towards these kids for letting us into their world and, and sharing so much of the, the uniqueness 
of high school today. Well, thanks for sharing it with our audience. Appreciate it. My pleasure. All right. Here, looking at a live shot down Georgia Street in Vancouver at 6.30 on this Thursday evening. You're watching CBC Vancouver News at 6. A beautiful day here on the South Coast. When we come back, we'll find out if the sun is going to stick around. Stay with us. A fast-moving forest fire is forcing the evacuation of a First Nations community in northern Ontario. It's a huge concern, and if, if you can put yourself in their shoes for even just a minute and, and just imagine that uh, a, a fire is blazing and the smoke is coming at them, it's, uh, it's a scary situation for all of the members, 3,800 members of the county. Yeah, the fire is within about two kilometres of that community. It's about two and a half hours northeast of Winnipeg. Some of the most vulnerable residents were flown out yesterday. Heavy smoke making it difficult for some people to breathe. It's also making it difficult to access the town's airport. And the number of evacuees in Alberta has nearly doubled in the last 24 hours. More than 10,000 people have been forced from their homes. One of the big factors is the growing Chuck Egg Creek wildfire near Paddle Prairie. Smoke from that fire is also having an impact further south. Environment Canada has put Edmonton, St. Albert and Sherwood Park under a special air quality statement. Edmonton's air quality health index is at 7, high risk. It's expected to get worse tonight but improve tomorrow. Once the marine layer burned off and the smoke kind of cleared out, it turned out to be another nice day today. Let's Some get sunshine. the full forecast. Yeah, it was good. Let's get the full forecast now and see what's ahead with Colette Kennedy. Colette? Thanks, Mike. You know, I thought we just, because we're having these mild days, okay, we just need a little reminder from the Almanac. What's our average high at this time of year? Yeah, just under 18. We'd round it up to 18 degrees, so we're doing pretty well, although not making records. That one's long-standing since 1956. But in terms of the patterns, what we're seeing with our weather, still dealing with this dominant ridge of high pressure. Now, at times, it's not strong enough, and in fact, with that daytime heating, it gives us some convection, and that's why we see some of those showers and thunderstorms with some pretty heavy downpours, especially especially into the southern interior. For tomorrow, we'll see it a little bit further eastward, but still, from the Columbia's onward, we'll see some of that. Now, closer to the coastline, we're looking at drier conditions until you get a little bit further north up the coastline towards Prince Rupert. Things change, and I'll show you that in the forecast in just a moment. 
But the real change that comes into the weekend isn't so much that we lose the influence of high pressure, it's that the winds will turn towards the west and get a bit stronger, and so that's going to help with some of the hazy conditions and the smoke kind of pushing it back towards Alberta. There are those showers for Prince Rupert I mentioned for tomorrow, 14, 18 for Port Hardy, and then we get into the heat as we stretch into the interior. Kamloops, 32 degrees with mostly sunny skies, but as I mentioned, some convective activity. Hard to pinpoint exactly where, but you have to watch out for some of those heavier downpours. The forecast for Comox tomorrow, mostly sunny, 25. Nanaimo at 26. Squamish, 27. Abbotsford, 26. Hope at 27. And even what a lovely day in Victoria with mostly sunny skies, low 20s that we're talking about with that high around 23. The five-day forecast looks like this. Again, the reminder that inland tomorrow, 26. The humidex up there around 28, 29. Otherwise, we're talking about 21 for the city. Saturday, a mix of sun and cloud. Still those temperatures running a good four degrees or so above seasonal values. They come down a little bit into Monday and Tuesday. But if we look ahead, we're still seeing that into next week, we're generally into the same pattern, although temperatures just a little bit cooler. Anita, Mike? Looks good. Thanks, Colette. To Ontario now, where it's not fire that's the concern, but water. Lake Ontario water levels have now reached their highest level in recorded history. That has residents of the Toronto Islands continuing to watch the situation closely. The city says water has breached some areas and the high water has forced ferry service to be cancelled. The city is operating pumps to keep water levels down. More than 20,000 sandbags have been placed across the islands to protect homes and businesses. Well, the U.S. Vice President visited our country today. Mike Pence is a predictable character from a very unpredictable presidency. All the drama north and south of the border coming next. In December, an arrest was made that put Canada into the middle of a trade war between the United States and China. Ms. Mung, what do you have to say to the charges? I'm Stephen Quinn, the host of a new CBC Vancouver original podcast. This is Sanction, the arrest of a telecom giant. It's the complicated story of how and why Huawei CFO Meng Wanzhou was arrested. Download Sanction today at cbc.ca slash sanctioned or wherever you get your podcasts.
Well, U.S. Vice President Mike Pence paid a visit to Ottawa today. He arrived this morning to meet with Prime Minister Justin Trudeau on a range of issues, including the crisis in Venezuela and trade relations with China. But as Katie Simpson reports, the talks were dominated by a push to ratify the new North American free trade deal. There are no hard feelings to be found here. The vice president and prime minister are leaving trade tensions behind, vowing to get the new NAFTA into place as quickly as possible. We're uh, making energetic efforts uh, to move uh, approval through the Congress of the United States this summer. Sources say Mike Pence gave Justin Trudeau a heads up. The Trump administration would trigger a process to force Congress to vote on NAFTA within 30 days. That encouraged both men to give each other political cover to get the job done. I want to assure the people of Canada that your prime minister drove a hard bargain. Pence saluted Trudeau's toughness to help the prime minister defend against conservative attacks that he was too weak at the negotiating table. In exchange, Trudeau leaned on his credibility as a progressive liberal to make a plea to like-minded Democrats in the U.S. We look to uh, the U.S. Democrats to uh, understand our significant improvements and our issues that, uh, like Canadian liberals, they care deeply about. Both men appeared at ease, and with the unpredictable U.S. president out of the picture, there was no fear of the day's agenda being interrupted, even when uncomfortable issues came up, including abortion. Friends can have differences of opinion um, and still be friends. The collaborative spirit continued, with the U.S. signaling it will help Canada with China. We're going to continue to uh, urge uh, China uh, to release the Canadian citizens. Pence suggested Donald Trump may bring up the issue on the sidelines at the G20 next month with Chinese President Xi Jinping. Ending the visit on a high note seemed too good to be true. And of course, it was. Near the end of his day, Pence was forced off message by his boss and reports that Mexico may be hit with new tariffs that could upend NAFTA and all of the work he did today. Well, I don't want to comment on what may or may not occur. That's the, Katie Simpson, the CBC's Katie Simpson reporting from Ottawa tonight. U.S. President Donald Trump continues to say there's no reason for the Democrats to push for his impeachment. Trump defended himself to reporters a day after a special prosecutor, Robert Mueller, made a public statement about his investigation into Russian interference in the 2016 election. CBC's Lindsay Duncombe has more tonight from Washington, D.C. Before Donald Trump left the White House this morning, he stopped and spoke to reporters. He attacked he special counsel Robert Mueller's credibility. He insulted his team, and the president once again declared that he is innocent. I think Mueller is a true never-Trumper. He's somebody that dislikes Donald Trump. He's somebody that didn't get a job that he requested that he wanted very badly, and then he was appointed. And despite that, and despite $40 million, 18 Trump haters, including people that work for Hillary Clinton and some of the worst human beings on earth, they got nothing. It's pretty amazing. What Robert Mueller did yesterday is say out loud in his own voice that if his team had found that the president had not committed a crime, they would have said so. That's a contrary presentation to what we've been hearing from Donald Trump and from his attorney general, Bill Barr. And the effect has been that there is increasing pressure on Democratic leadership to move toward an impeachment hearing. Donald Trump reacted to that today. To me, it's a dirty word, the word impeach. It's a dirty, filthy, disgusting word. And it had nothing to do with me. So I don't think so, because there was no crime. You know, it's high crimes and, not with or or. It's high crimes and misdemeanors. There was no high crime and there was no misdemeanor. So how do you impeach based on that? The decision about whether or not to move towards impeachment falls to Nancy Pelosi. She's been reluctant to go there without bipartisan support. She says it could be divisive for the country and it could also be politically problematic for the Democrats. Even with Mueller's words yesterday, it is not clear that that calculation has changed. Lindsay Duncombe, CBC News, Washington. A House of Commons committee meeting took a dramatic turn today. The committee was examining hate speech when the meeting 
became hostile. As David Cochran tells us, a conservative MP forcefully challenged testimony from a Muslim community leader. There were no cameras at the Justice Committee on Tuesday, but there were microphones that captured a remarkable exchange between a witness and a conservative MP. Faisal Khan Suri was asked to testify about the dangers of online hate. He summarized the motivations of Alexandra Bissonnette, the killer behind the Quebec City mosque shootings. The evidence from Bissonnette's computer showed he repeatedly sought content about anti-immigrant, alt-right, and conservative commentators, mass murderers, U.S. President Donald Trump. Suri also referenced the shooting at a Pittsburgh synagogue and the massacre in Christchurch, New Zealand. It outraged conservative Michael Cooper. First of all, Mr. Suri, I take great umbrage with your defamatory comments to try to link conservatism with violent and extremist attacks. It's a sore spot for the conservatives as the liberals have tried to paint them as tolerant of extremists and white supremacists, something Andrew Scheer would deal with in a speech hours after this committee. There is absolutely no room in a peaceful and free country like Canada for intolerance, racism and extremism of any kind. But in rebutting Surrey, Cooper cited the manifesto of the Christchurch killer, a document banned in New Zealand for inciting hate. And let me, Mr. Chair, read into the record uh, the statement of Brendan Tarrant, who is responsible for the Christchurch massacre. He left a 74-page manifesto in which he stated, conservatism is corporatism in disguise. I want no part of it. The nation with the closest political and social values to my own is the People's Republic of China, close quote. So you should be ashamed. Now, with, with respect, with respect. Liberals and New Democrats exploded in protest. The committee went behind closed doors for 16 minutes to discuss Cooper's comments. Cooper emerged partially apologetic. I, I will withdraw saying that he should be uh, ashamed. So in the spirit of moving forward, I withdraw those specific comments, but certainly not the rest of what I said. Surrey never responded to Cooper's comments at committee. He's back in Edmonton now and declined our request for an interview. Michael Cooper was in Parliament today, but he told us he wasn't available for comment. David Cochran, CBC News, Ottawa. Israel is heading back to the polls less than two months after the last election. That's because Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu missed the deadline to form a coalition government to run the country. So now, as Susan Ormiston explains, a divided country and a divisive leader are right back where they started. Back to this, more pushy, scrabbling campaigning, with now a second election complicating the timetable for a U.S.-led peace plan. Awkward when your first guest today is Jared Kushner, President Trump's advisor on that plan. Interesting. After all Trump did for Bibi, Netanyahu could not close the deal as the Knesset dissolved last night. Even though we had a little event last night, uh, that's not going to stop us. But for many Israelis, it is a big, unwanted event. We've become like a third world country when people are worried about their personalities instead of about the country's politics. Barely two months ago, Netanyahu narrowly captured the most seats. Benjamin Netanyahu. But in a six-week search for coalition partners, he came up one short, ostensibly over military service. Ultra-Orthodox parties who supported him wanted to continue to exempt Orthodox Israelis from conscription. But the former defense minister, Avigdor Lieberman, whose party might have gone with Netanyahu, dug in. We'll do everything, Lieberman said, to form a national government, not an ultra-Orthodox government. It reflects a growing schism. It's a dynamic between the secular and ultra-Orthodox elements within Israeli society, not just the military service law, but also in issues like businesses being open on the Sabbath or public transportation on the Sabbath and kosher laws and so on. Already, Bibi's opponents are emboldened with another chance to throw him out or force him to face charges for alleged corruption. 
I think it's early days to tell if Netanyahu is, uh, is weakened or not. Even in unpredictable Israeli politics, few expected another vote this September. Susan Ormiston, CBC News, Toronto. The Netflix series 13 Reasons Why has been controversial from the start with its focus on a teen suicide. Now, a new study co-authored by a Canadian psychiatrist takes a closer look at suicides by teens and tweens before and after the series was released. As Deanna Sumanak johnson reports, researchers say TV producers need to make some changes. Ask psychiatrist Mark Sr. about 13 Reasons Why and he'll give you his reasons for concern. It glamorized and romanticized suicide. Um, it uh, presented the suicide methods. It um, didn't describe the contribution of uh, treatable mental disorder, which is present in almost all suicides. Senior is the Canadian co-author of the most recent study to examine the possible effects of the Netflix drama centered around a teen girl who takes her own life. It found that in the three months after the show's release in 2017, there were 94 more suicides among 10 to 19-year-olds in the United States than would be expected. The study could not directly link the suicides to the show, but... What we saw was a sudden increase in suicides only in youth, not in older people, and in particular in young women. That's exactly what we would expect if a contagion phenomenon was happening. So it's not proof but it's very strong evidence. In an email to CBC News, a Netflix spokesperson questioned the study's methodology and findings and said, 13 Reasons Why tackles the uncomfortable reality of life for many young people today, and we've heard from them, as well as medical experts, that it gave many viewers the courage to speak up and get help. The study authors call for film and TV creators to enlist the help of professionals when depicting suicide, something the creators of 13 Reasons Why did do. Degrassi co-creator Linda Schuyler says she relied heavily on experts' opinions when her show depicted teen suicide. Let's be honest, our young audience are talking about suicide. They are dealing with it. So to back away and pretend it doesn't exist is also doing a disservice. But but it has to be dealt with responsibly. How different creators will interpret that remains to be seen. Deanna Sumanak Johnson, CBC News, Toronto. Well, the Canadian Coast Guard's newest icebreaker was unveiled today in Newfoundland. It's named after a groundbreaking captain. More on her after the break.
Friday on the early edition, we will be taking the show on location to L.A. Matheson Secondary School in Surrey. It's a celebration of high school life from the Surrey cafeteria. It all begins at 5 a.m. right here on CBC Radio 1. Down the I-5 in Seattle, an iconic part of that city is slowly disappearing, remaking the way the city looks and feels. And a time lapse is capturing it all. Now, the Alaskan Way viaduct is slowly and dramatically being torn down. In place since the 1950s, the two-level highway cut off the city's waterfront and downtown. An earthquake back in 2001 caused a bit of damage, but it raised the specter of something much more tragic. So a tunnel was built to replace it, and that opened in early February. So now the viaduct is coming down, with demolition expected to be wrapped up in June. And a new park promenade is expected to replace the highway by 2021. Wow, that's just incredible. Very different look. It'll look a lot nicer, I think. And, of course, people are looking at this to see what could potentially happen here with our... Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay, the Coast Guard's newest icebreaker is named after a pioneering sea captain. As Peter Cowan reports, the Canadian Molly Cool was the first woman in North America to captain a ship. This new ship is an important one for the Coast Guard for two big reasons. Let's first talk about the capabilities. This is the first new icebreaker in 25 years for the Coast Guard. It's needed because many of the other ships are getting old. They need to go in for repairs. So the Captain Molly Cool is one of the newer ships that's going to be sent out to service. Because even though it's new to the Coast Guard, it's not actually new. It's an 18-year-old used ship that the Coast Guard purchased from Sweden, gave it a new coat of paint, and now it's pressed into service. Uh, this interim uh, capacity icebreaker will provide us with uh, the sustainability to continue with our services while our other vessels are getting refitted or vessel life extension. Well, who was Captain Molly Cool? She was the very first female captain in all of North America. She is from New Brunswick and she was remembered today as a trailblazer. She wrote the exams in 1939 and for five years she captained a ship up and down the Bay of Fundy. Today, her sister was here all the way from California to remember her as a trailblazer. I just didn't feel that men should have the opportunities that women should be just as well off as men. It really annoyed her that they had things that she didn't, that were opportunities. It's fitting that one of the captains on board this ship is also a woman, but her and her crew aren't going to have a lot of time to celebrate. They've got to get this ship ready to head up to the Arctic. They won't be back until the fall. Peter Cowan, CBC News, St. John's. And you don't have to travel to a galaxy far, far away to pilot the Millennium Falcon or encounter Kylo Ren. But you will need to make a trip to California. Disneyland's new Galaxy's Edge Park opens tomorrow. We want to capture that emotion again. When you first fell in love with Star Wars, we want you to have that feeling all over again. Now, the park is set on a planet called Batu, a fresh setting not seen in any of the movies. Diehard fans will notice details like droid tracks and signage written in the fictional language. Disney's story editors plan to evolve Galaxy's Edge like a franchise with changing stories and characters. Another Star Wars park will open at Disney World in Florida in late August. It'll probably be just immensely popular. Very popular. Yeah, Are you yeah. big Star Wars fan? Uh, yeah, I, I, I could check it out. Oh, okay. Maybe I'm due for a trip to Disney World. Maybe you are. Maybe I am. <laughs> well, that is it for our program tonight. You can always find it online at cbc.ca slash b and uh, bc and Dan Burt's here. At, at uh, 11 o'clock, right after the National. Have a good night.